Hello and welcome back to Char Reads. Today I'm going to be talking about My Year of Rest and Relaxation by Otessa Moshveg. Um, it got really dark in here so I've had to turn the proper lights on. It is what it is. My Year of Rest and Relaxation released in 2018 is about a young pretty woman. Um, we never get a name for the narrator so I'm just going to call her the narrator. The narrator is a 26 year old young very very rich um, white orphaned woman uh, who lives on the Upper East Side in Manhattan in her own apartment. And her goal at the start of the book is to sleep for a whole year. Um, you, you, she never like articulates why, really. She just kind of describes it as a sort of hibernation. Um, but she, yeah, she gets fired from her job in an art gallery for like napping. And she gets a really wacky psychiatrist who will just like endlessly prescribe her more medication. So she's like drugging herself to fall asleep will occasionally like wake up um, and go down to the bodega and get a coffee, two coffees, and will any time that she's not sleeping, she'll watch VHSs on repeat. This is in the year 2000 and 2001, by the way. So it's, I think the year starts in June on the year 2000. Gosh, I love this book. <laughs> I really loved it. It has so many things that make me love a book, which is one, having a main character that no one really likes. I don't know why, I just really like unrelatable protagonists. It's just also this torpid self-destruction and like ennui that I'm really drawn to. I'm not a very naturally depressive person, but I find books about fiction about depressed people. I'm really drawn to the emptiness of it. Also it's about like a young hot girl in New York doing a load of drugs which is like just kind of a cool basis for a novel anyway. So our narrator basically only ever sees two people. One is her best friend Reva and the other is her kind of on and off boyfriend Trevor. Um, I think these are both really interesting characters. So Reva, oh I love Reva. Their relationship is that the narrator like hates Reva <laughs> but still kind of loves her. In the book the narrator describes Reva as I loved her, but I didn't like her anymore. She is just a character that our narrator loves to hate and loves to feel superior to, and I love that dynamic. I don't know if it's very normal, but I have an extremely similar dynamic with someone. Gosh, I really hope they don't watch this. Um, but uh, I just very strongly identified with that. I had to admit that it was a comfort to have Reva there. She was just as good as a VCR, I thought. The cadence of her speech was as familiar and predictable as the audio from any movie I'd watched a hundred times. That's why I'd held on to her this long. I thought as I lay there, not listening. Since I'd known her, the drone of what ifs, the seemingly endless descriptions of her delusional romantic projections had become a kind of lullaby. Reva was a magnet for my angst. She sucked it right out of me. I was a Zen Buddhist monk when she was around. I was above fear, above desire, above worldly concerns in general. I could live in the now in our company. I had no past or present, no thoughts. I was too evolved for all her jibber jabber and too cool. Her hatred of Reva says a lot more about her than it says about Reva. I just love that they can both be really satisfied with this friendship when they don't actually enjoy each other's company and like keep it going. Oh, I, just, I love it, it speaks to me. The other person that she still kind of communicates with is this guy, Trevor. Um, who she met when she was 18, a freshman in college, and he was 33, and he is a banker wanker, and we hate him. He is such a fucking narcissist, and he never prioritizes her at all. There's one point in the book where she's like, hey, if you could only have sex or only have blowjobs for the rest of your life, which would you have? Um, and he was like, blowjobs. And she was like, is that a bit gay? And, he, and then they didn't speak for six weeks. But then like inevitably they'd have these like random vicious fights and but they would always come back to each other. He is one of those absolute fuck boys and you all, you know them, who will just, just like not let a girl have anything and give them the tiniest, tiniest little show of interest and that will be enough. And since she's known this man since like her formative adult years, she's so drawn into this relationship um, that she can't, like, she doesn't have a personality and well, she doesn't mean anything. She's so fucking downtrodden because she hasn't been shown to have value. And that's one thing I found really interesting about this. It's not, I'm going to be alone for a year and be really introspective and think about myself. It's, it's like, I want to erase myself. It's like she doesn't have 
an ego. The only time she has an ego is when it is in conflict with something that she hates or feels superior to, like her relationship with Reva and her relationship with like the art world that she's like kind of adjacent to. But when she's alone, she wants nothingness which is just like a fascinating idea to me. She's never, or at least very rarely, like, I want to die. She's more, I just want to not exist for a while and then maybe I'm gonna like emerge. She does refer to it as hibernation and there is a plan to like then slowly come back and rejoin society and life, but she really feels like this, this time of rest will be like rehabilitating to her. So this whole thing is, like kind of all about grief. It's also kind of not about grief, but basically her parents both died um, within a couple months of each other when she was a, a student. I think she was 20 or 21. Um, and they, her dad was a professor um, and he never really showed any joy to her. He, she describes both of her parents as joyless. So her dad, I think seemed to have like quite a rich life, but only when he was teaching and actually like didn't pay very much attention to her at home. And her mother um, was a complete drunk. She committed suicide like three months or so after um, her dad died. And uh, yeah, her mother was just a very like commanding, um, like hard to love woman, but she still did love both of her parents. Um, but because they didn't, they didn't, again, ascribe any value to her really, or give, like, show her much. She didn't have any, like, belief in herself as having any, like, actually lovable value. She knew that she had value in terms of vanity and money, um, but she didn't feel like she had any actual personal value. And I think when her parents died, she was just completely untethered. And I think when most people are having issues with depression um there's usually some sort of support network that will force you to confront life in whatever way that may be but she doesn't have anyone that's going to force her to do anything because the only person that really cares about her is reva and she's going to completely disregard whatever reva's opinion is because reva's a fucking idiot <laughs> reva isn't a fucking idiot but she just feels so superior to her that like her opinion wouldn't matter and reva also doesn't have the the, the guts to force anything on her friend. So because she's so untethered, she gets to approach this depression and this ennui and this purposelessness with whatever strategy seems to make sense for her and the strategy that she feels would make sense is to try and sleep for a whole year. And you gotta give it to her, like, respect. Especially having like a deadline of it. It's not like I'm gonna sleep forever. It's like, I've got, I'm gonna give myself a year and then I'll be fine. And the thing is because she's so, because her, her parents are rich um, and she owns a house outright and she, like she has like a lot of money and stocks and, and whatnot, um, she can literally afford to do nothing. She can, she'd afford to like spend money and still be completely fine, which is such a bloody privileged position. <laughs> and the only position from which you can decide to sleep for a whole year. Um, but it's great. She's quite a sharp character. Her comments on things are very acidic and she's very decisive. Um, which I really enjoy in a character. And the, the way this novel progresses, I think it's at a really wonderful pace because slowly as she's getting more isolated, she's actually becoming a lot more erratic. Like she takes this drug that completely blacks her out for three days, but like she's done a load of random shit in those three days, but she doesn't remember it. So it's kind of like she was sleeping through it. Um, and it just gets kind of really intense. Um, but you know, there's like, this deadline for all of this craziness so you don't worry too much and um, there's also because this is taking place in new york in the year 2000 2001 um we learn from the very start that trevor the the boyfriend works in the world trade center and then somewhere maybe like the middle of the book reva gets transferred to a place in the world trade center and the whole book i was like i mean this is it's got a 9-11's got to happen in this book doesn't it um and that's kind of like where the the book ends is is in September of, of 2001. And I was so looking forward to how she would handle that. And I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was picture perfect. I really loved this book and it's going to be one of my favorite books. It's going on my favorite shelf. Um, and I don't see myself really rereading it because I had such a beautifully encapsulated reading experience of it. 
um, I don't need to come back to it, but I, I did enjoy it immensely. So if this sounds up your street, give it a go. Uh, I've got links down below. Um, and if you have read it, let me know what you think of it and if you liked it as much as me. Because I can see for, for a lot of people that aren't into the whole like ennui, depressive, self-destructive novel thing, like I can see why it wouldn't be your cup of tea. It's, it's like not a very palatable protagonist, but just really up my street. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I'll see you in the next one.